Well, I mean, I guess just to kind of put it in context, I mean, to the average kid riding these days, the interlock chain is <coughs> simply just a chain. It's kind of the standard these days. But what were the options back in uh, the early 2000s before you guys put out the first interlock? I mean, it's, it's funny when you think about it now, because in 2006, the, the halfling chain, the interlock chain, it is kind of normal place. But at the time, when we, when we came out with chain, chains were really designed for, for 10 speeds, road bikes. Or they were excessively built, like moped chains, that were really strong, but added 10 pounds to your bike, figuratively speaking. You know? So when you think about chains before, they were like little, little race chains like this one, you know, that's just like really small, flimsy, you know. Everyone think remembers before the interlock chains, like how many broken teeth and broken kneecaps you had, you know. So it's, it's funny. It's how, how everything works, right? It becomes commonplace in time, you know. But in 2002, when we started the brand, when we started Shadow Conspiracy, it was one of our very first ideas that we wanted to make a chain, you know. And, but it was so complex, and we went to every single factory in Taiwan and asked them to make this chain for us and they all told us no there's no need for this this concept when we started the brand Byron Anderson one of the, he's one of the, the original pro riders for the team and he's actual our our engineer and SolidWorks designer for Shadow even today he came up with this idea and and it was a common problem you know that like you know I mean people you broke your chains all the time but then as street riding and street as street riding took even more presence of the style of riding, it became even more obvious that chains were breaking a lot, you know. So now someone at a major factory, they didn't see that because they're they weren't in the streets. You know, they weren't thinking about it. they weren't the ones cracking their kneecaps on their stems. You know, it's like it definitely was a need. It might not have been obvious to a factory owner, you know, but I think in the true riders knew that you needed something. But to reinvent a product like a chain, man, it's 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 pretty complex. The process of developing a chain obviously starts with a, a concept, which Byron Anderson had a concept, and then we proved concept through sampling. The, the process was mind-numbing, to be quite honest. It was so difficult, you know, just trying to get, trying to get factories willing to believe in our, because not only did we have to get a factory to believe in us, we had to basically retool the machines. You know, to build these these chains, which was really complex, really, really, really difficult, you know. And that's where one of our biggest hurdles came in and why it took us took us about two years, I believe, if I remember correctly, before it actually came out on the market. We had the idea, you know, we launched Shadow Conspiracy in 2002. We, we had the idea as part of the original launch. So it, it probably didn't come out till... Till probably I would guess around 2004 ish, 2003, somewhere in there. So it took a minute, you know, for it to come out. But it was, um, but yeah, it, it took a, it took a two years or so, and we probably went through about four different factories at minimum, selling the idea, you know. So and we finally found our own factory. And the factory even today that makes our makes our chains for us only makes our chains. So all the fake knockoff cheap chains, half links that are out there are made not made at the same place as ours. It was it was really I mean you're talk you're talking tens of thousands of dollars of investment and years of communication and flights to Asia figuring it out. I the, honestly the only scary part was just trying to make sure that the factories believed in us and didn't backdoor something on us, you know, like that was scary, but the other thing that was kind of wild is that when we were developing the chain, when you look at the, here's the, the V1, and then the actual V2, which I'm showing at the, in the camera angle here, is that the V2, in the midst of development, micro gearing came into effect in modern frames. And that was right in the middle of all of our development. And then basically, which most chains most chains had a problem fitting on 9th 2 drivers at that time because 9 twos were still kind of exotic at the time, you know? It was like, if you remember, it was always 16 tooth drivers were the standard. Yeah. And, and it would, the traditional chains would skip on the 9 twos. So. They would skip, they would pop, they would break chains. You know, when, it, when people were running the original kind of like, we call them 10-speed chains, you know, the 410s, they, 
they they would snap, and yeah. it, due to the the pressure that they were getting in that tight radius of a turn, yeah. you know. So for us, probably the whole time became a little bit like, oh shit, we just released the V1, and instantly micro gearing really took over, you know. So we had the problem solve that, which you know you look at the you look at the radius on the on the chain, and you're like, oh yeah, man, that's that's a simple concept, but at the time. It wasn't that simple, you know. It's, it was it was scary because you know, like you just like your question asked is like, were we ever scared? We weren't ever scared because we were probably blindfully so stoked on the idea that like it, it didn't occur to us how risky it was, even though it was. You know what I mean? Like it was extremely risky because no one had reinvented a chain. Like we changed shadow chains to face of chains. It's the very first halfling chain in the market. It's not patented because there's there's been use of halfling chains in industrial products in the early 1800s that, you know, it just it didn't, we couldn't patent it. Really, when we started the interlock chain design process, our objectives were, was, was micro gearing. It was, um, we wanted to achieve strength via the design. There's two strengths, your tensile strength, which is when you, when you actually, the strength that you see like in our videos right now that we put out, is how much strength you know you can apply to it the other part was is the interlocking plate designs when faced in the correct direction when you grind they can't spread apart so the idea of that is like huge because that's the big problem though is because when 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 the bash guards came off the bikes and the simplicity of the bikes became more important chains started breaking even more you know, and an interlock chain essentially saved that problem because with a traditional chain, it's um, it's a plate inside a plate inside a plate. So when you pull, when you snag one plate, it rips off the entire link. Where an interlock, if you happen to do that, it's still going to stay intact and not come completely apart. You know, which sounds simplistic now, but it's actually a pretty revolutionary idea. You still hear riders always are going to be conscious of weight because it is important, right? You know, especially rotational weight is your most important aspect on your bike, which is your wheels, your tires, your, you know, your rims. That's rotational weight is actually your center weight of your bike is almost not important. You almost want a little bit of weight in your bike there. So in my opinion, I think there's two places on your bike you don't want to get too light. That's your chain and your forks. Because when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. You know, so we, we definitely were conscious of weight because that's important on a BMX bike, you know, strength to weight ratio. But we think that also too that it's it's you you shouldn't be worried about it on things that the consequences are so big. Whew, man, I mean when you're when you're just dealing with manufacturing English to English, it's difficult because you're, you're, you have a concept and that's exactly what that is, is a concept, you know? So we probably went through about 20 samples, I believe is what we went through and probably give or take two years of development time. And probably, I would guess and say we probably did maybe about, um, half a dozen trips based on this project to Asia. But overall, Byron's concept pretty much stayed strong all the way through the, the process. Dealing with manufacturers, you know, I mean, they're obviously gonna wanna make the best product, but they're, they're gonna be able to make the best product by what they know and by the, the, the pitfalls of what they've already learned in the past which is, is logical, you know, you're like, hey man, they, they have things they don't really want to revisit again, but sometimes it takes a fresh perception, and with a fresh perception, you have to stand your ground. And a lot of brands, when they go into development, they will, they will, they will veer from their concept. Yeah. And you, you can't do that. I mean, granted, you have to understand in manufacturing when to give and when to take, you know, and that's a really important thing in product development because if you're so idealistic that you're so hard on your concept, it might never come out in fruition, you know, never come to fruition, you know, so um, with us, we were lucky that Byron's concept was strong enough that it was really, ours was really more of a challenge of how do you make this thing at this level of strength. Coming from, you know, from, 
from V1 to V2, which you know, if you look at the, the two here, you can see the differences of V1 and V2. Um, going from V1 to V2, the main difference was we did some pin improvement and they basically made it function perfectly on micro gearing. You know, that V2 has been around since I think essentially 12 years, I think, it's been in the market. In 12 years, there's now a couple handfuls of fake interlock chains, and still 12 years later, the interlock, the Shadow Interlock V2 chain is still the strongest. But with that being said, there's still a style of writing that demands an even stronger chain. That's where the idea of the, the Supreme Chain came in. At the time of the Supreme Chain, I'll just kind of show you a picture of the, the, the Supreme Chain. It's, it's the first ever forged plate chain ever made in the bicycle industry. This took three years of development because nothing's ever done a forged plate chain plate before and it's so small that forging things so tiny is a real hassle <laughs> man i mean it's it's mind numbing and it kept breaking the machines the tools so we had to keep using different types of materials that the tools were made out of to stamp the plates because when you do this you stamp a raw stock and then it has three other stages of actual forging to get it all the way down to the correct shape the thing with forging that's awesome is that each time you forge it, it changes the structure of the metal. So as you keep going, it actually keeps becoming stronger as you go th as you forge it, which is an extremely expensive process, you know. But by doing this, you're able to to almost eliminate stretch in the chain, and you essentially almost eliminate breakage. The, the Supreme Chain was, was really difficult because we, we had to start the process over from how do you make the chain link plate, then how do you actually assemble it. You know, there was different variances between the two links, so it, it, was, it was a complex. And then also, it trying when we first came up with the concept, we showed it at Interbike, it was going to be $110 retail, <laughs> you know. And we knew that wasn't the case, but we wanted to show the concept. We worked it down to 59 bucks or 50, 59 bucks, I think, is what it is now at retail. The interesting thing about doing this interview with Ride BMX right now is like, is being able to tell the history. Sometimes over time, we as consumers, you forget where stuff came from. Like, who invented yeah. Velcro? You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, but then there was actually a company that invented Velcro and now it's really called Hook and Loop, you know? But that, which is essentially like what the half link has done in the market but even with that there's always a superior product you know because when you race to the bottom just for price you always have to sacrifice strength and quality you know so being able to talk with ride today it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because i think the idea of telling the history and letting like maybe a rider that's only been in bmx for two years like hey man this is what shadow did why we did it the the trials and tribulations of overcoming it and then still holding true to our our, our philosophy of why we want to make the best chains in BMX. I mean, is there room for innovation in a BMX chain? I, into, absolutely, there's always gonna be room for innovation because BMX riding and the style riding is always evolving. But as far as today's riding and probably the near future of riding, I think the Interlock V2 and Interlock Supreme chain are pretty much gonna be the rider's best choice. Half the battle of riding is the mind fuck. And if you have anything on your bike you don't trust 100%, you're not going to have the confidence to pull the trick that you want to do, you know? So having confidence not only in yourself, in your riding ability, but in what's on your bike is imperative. You have to have that. And I believe the Interlock V2 and the Interlock Supreme Chain gives that. So. I don't believe today there's room for innovation, but I believe that there will always be innovation. We, you know, it took us about 18 months to come up with the plan for how to test chains in the lab. Because real world testing, it, it's impossible to have real world testing that's consistently objective all the way across for every single product. So lab testing is really important. Lab testing alone is not enough to guarantee that any product is perfect for the rider. 
you know, but but through that it took us about 18 months. You know, our goal our goal is is to to prove scientifically because we do believe that we proved in real world that the chain works. So now to 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 add data, to add numbers to the scientifically doing a test was really important you know and tensile strength is a great test it's not the only it's not the only variable in the strength of any product but it's a great test to prove and and a test across the board you know so i want people to know you know with the testing video it's yeah sure i'd love for people to know that these other brands are fake imitation copies of our chain we did the idea and we spent the money on the mold, the real testing, the scientific testing. We went through, you know, essentially, you know, 12, 14 years of development to make these products. So to make this test, it's more so we just want to prove how much Shadow cares about the end result of our products. That we really, we're not trying to say we're the smartest people in BMX, you know, but I guarantee we're one of the top most caring brands in the industry. You know, like we care. And we want to prove that that we're not just going out and just buying stuff off the shelf and saying, "Hey, here's our here's our new chain." You know, like we took the risk, you know, and and we proved concept. And now I see everyone else jumping on it, and you know, more power to them. Whatever, you know what I mean. You know, everyone's got a commodity product in their collection, you know. But for us, showing we care scientifically was the most important thing to show that our chains are the best. That's the main thing that I want to try to like prove through is that just because it looks similar doesn't mean it is the same. And that's something right now that we got to, you know, I'm hoping we can prove. The other thing I, I love about doing this interview with Ride BMX is that I want the rider that doesn't know a lot about Shadow to know that there is humans behind that product. There is people that have invested their lives into BMX and that it that this is an extremely personal product to us, you know, and that's that sounds obvious, but it's not in the world of mass production. It's funny because BMX is a gateway to lifelong cyclists, but yeah. very few products do come from BMX and transcend into other parts of the cycling world. And the, the interlock chains have gone into other parts, and they and a lot of the pro guys and and dual slalom and, and freestyle slope, you know, they they run interlock chains. You know, I mean, <laughs> when you're going Mach five down a mountain and launching fifty foot doubles, I think you want to make sure your chain doesn't break. You know, it's like, but we're a BMX company, and we want our passion to be driven by BMX. And if others want to follow, man, we're we're totally into it. But it's it's BMX first.